And as you can see, the entire United States almost is still at a very high and extremely high, high risk. Those that are at low risk, we have a really few um, locations, an area in New Mexico, an area in Colorado. So yes, our numbers are going down, but we are not out of the, the woods just yet. And let's compare this to September, December, and um, literally a few days ago, March. So yes, our numbers were very high in December and in, and in January, but we're not even seeing enough green just yet compared to September. So all this to say the numbers are going, going down, but we still have plenty of, of work to do. I always like to start off with a case because what COVID is all about is about people and lives. So I work at Emory Midtown. One of the first patients that I took care of, actually the first patient that I took care of, was exactly a year ago. It was Friday, March 13th, 2020. She was a 77-year-old um, Black woman with hypertension and asthma, and she came to the hospital with, you know, a, a lot of shortness of breath, and she had been short of breath for, um, for um, a while. Um, at least a couple weeks had gone to two urgent care centers and finally made it to the, to the hospital. When she got there, her oxygen levels were low, 84% on room air, and you would want that to be well over 90 to, uh, 90%. Um, at this point, we were not surprised that she was diagnosed with, with COVID. So what I noticed very early on was that my first COVID patient was Black, the second COVID patient was Black, the third COVID patient was Black. So it did not take me very long to realize this is disproportionately affecting people who look just, just like me. Um, and I'm sure you all have heard in the news that COVID has been disproportionately affecting Black, Indigenous, Latinx, and other um, um, peoples of color. So it has had a significant effect on the, the Black community. So let's, let's take a look at this, this table, which is going to look at COVID-19 cases, hospitalizations, and deaths. And we're going to look at this by race and ethnicity. So in the, the white box, we have, um, we're going to compare all of these to the rate ratios of white um, non-Hispanic persons. We're going to look at American Indian, Asian, Blacks, and, and Hispanics. So if you take a look here, cases, hospitalizations, and, and deaths. So I want to highlight a couple things for you. So if you are Black or Hispanic, you have a 2.9 times or a 3.2 times increased rate ratio of hospitalization, okay? And if we look at deaths, if you're Black or Hispanic and you contract COVID, you have an increased likelihood of death as well, 1.9 and 2.3 times, okay? So this is disproportionately affecting the underrepresented minorities in each of these, um, these categories. So the question always comes up, why? Okay, when we think about health equity considerations and um, racial and ethnic minority groups. And we have to be really upfront to say that this is because of longstanding systemic health and social inequities, okay? We have to say it, it's okay to say it, this is, this is, this is what it is. So why? So Black and minority populations um, are more likely to not have access to testing, may not have a physician, may not have anyone to call and say, I'm not feeling well, may live in higher density settings, multi-generational homes where you have from the grandchild, grand, grandkid all the way up to, to, to grandmother. And if the parents have to leave home to go to work, you're at a more um, um, likelihood of contracting COVID. Increased likelihood of being exposed to pol pollution. We have an increased likelihood of having pre-existing pre conditions such as high blood pressure and diabetes and asthma. And if you're an essential worker, if you have to leave your house to go and drive the MARTA bus, if you have to leave your house and go to um, take care of someone as a healthcare worker, if you have to leave your home and you work as a grocery um, um, store worker, you're at an increased risk of contracting COVID. And this is all on top of racial bias in healthcare. So so just like there's racial bias in every other aspect of, of life, you know, it breaks my heart to say this, but yes, we have racial bias in, in healthcare as, as well. So this is why it's extraordinarily important, okay, that everyone receives vaccines, but we really need the Black community to know why it's so important for us to receive the vaccine as, as well. So let's just talk about some of the basics of the, the, the vaccine. 
that um, here is the virus, okay, right in the center, and the virus has these what we call spike or S proteins, spike proteins, and the entire um, um, goal of a vaccine is for your body to make antibodies to this protein, okay, and the each of the vaccines that we have available, the whole point is they are making this S protein, not the actual virus, making this protein so that our body is essentially fooled into thinking, oh, this is the actual virus and you develop um, immunity. So let's talk a little bit about messenger RNA because it's been everywhere. It's on in, you know, Instagram, Facebook, on, on the news. So messenger RNA, I like to think about it as being a blueprint to make that spike protein, because that's what you want your body to make so that you can develop antibodies. So within, so the messenger RNA is packaged within a little tiny little lipid or fat bubble, okay? That is injected into your muscle. Your body uses that um, blueprint to make the spike protein. Again, all it's making is the protein itself. It's not making the, the, the virus. Your body sees that protein and says, huh, this is foreign. Uh, we need to, you know, to, to um, start fighting against it. So you have, you develop the antibodies. So that's what messenger RNA is. You know, a lot of people say, oh, this is, you know, new technology, but I want everyone to know that we were, we as an in the infectious diseases um, community have been working on messenger RNA virus um, vaccines for um, a, a decade. Um, with respects to Ebola and, and the plan is to use messenger RNA for other um, um, viruses as well. So this did not just start in January um, 2020. So which of the vaccines are um, messenger RNA? There are two, there's the Pfizer and the Moderna. Both of these vaccines are um, honestly so sim similar. They're both have 95% effectiveness, uh, but the most important thing is is that all of all of these vaccine trials, there were no deaths and no hospitalizations in those who received the, the vaccine. That's the most important part, preventing death and, and hospitalizations. Um, the difference in administration, so I received the Pfizer vaccine and you get the first vaccine and then 21 days later, you get the second. The Moderna you get the first and then 28 days later, you receive your second. So these are um, two shot vaccines. The difference with the Johnson and Johnson, so the Johnson and Johnson is what we call a viral vector vaccine, okay? Which has been used for, you know, over 20, 20, 30 years for many, many other vaccines. So what it takes is it uses, it, um, rather than the messenger RNA, it packages within an inactivated cold virus called adenovirus, not an active virus, um, material, genetic material that goes into your body. Your body um, um, develops and makes the, again, the spike protein, not the virus itself, and your body develops antibodies to it. So the current one viral vector vaccine that we have available is the Johnson & Johnson. With respect, and it's one injection compared to two with the messenger RNA um, vaccines. The Johnson & Johnson, um, I, I find that a lot of people are are trying to compare the messenger RNA vaccines to the viral va vector vaccines, you can't compare them neck and neck, okay? So yes, the Johnson & Johnson um, vaccine effectiveness is lower than the vaccine effectiveness of the um, messenger RNA. So it's about 67% all comers, but this is the key. And I'm, I'm not seeing that they're putting this on the news. In those, in these trials who received this vaccine, there were zero deaths and zero hospitalizations. So if we're looking at the bottom line, we don't want people to die. We don't want people to, to end up in the hospital. Both of these vaccines, or three of these vaccines do that extraordinarily well, okay? So what should you um, expect after you receive the, the COVID vaccine? So I like to think about COVID vaccines. There's um, a term that we call reactogenicity, which we tell people to expect this, okay? And then I'm gonna talk about safety. So reactogenicity, these are the things like sore arm, a little bit of redness at the site, um, um, muscle aches, 
fatigue, headache, nausea, vomiting, and fever. The, um, the top three are the most common, okay? When I got my vaccine, my left arm was sore as it can be after that, that first shot. I happen to not have any of the other symptoms. After the second um, shot, I almost felt, felt nothing. However, one of my friends who's a physician, after her second shot, she developed some fevers and did not feel well for 24 hours. So this reactogenicity is common. It is what we anticipate. However, it's short-lived, 24 to, to 72 two hours, okay? And up to 80% of, of people may feel one of these reactogenicity um, um, side effects, okay? So reactogenicity means that your immune system is working. So that sore arm, that achiness, those chills, that means that your body is making these antibodies to fight off what it thinks is the true um, coronavirus um, 19. So this is the most important thing everyone wants to know, are these vaccines safe? They were made quickly. Is this safe? Is it okay for me to receive it and in my loved ones? So I always like to tell everyone that the FDA always takes every vaccine through three phases, one, two, and three. None of these um, um, phases were skipped with any of these vaccines. Phase one always starts with about 20 healthy adults. Okay, and this, the, this started happening very early in, in 2020. And in these healthy people you see, is it safe? Are, you know, are, are they doing okay? Are we seeing any serious side effects? Then you go to, to phase two where it's several hundred healthy adults. And then you transition to phase three. And these phase three trials started during the, um, the summer where we're talking about hundreds of thousands. So with the two messenger RNA um, trials, we we're talking over 70,000 people. Um, received these vaccines before they um, 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 underwent emergency use authorization. So yes, no steps were, were, were skipped. And as a physician, you know, as a country, safety is everyone's top priority. So we have these vaccine adverse event reporting systems and when you all go to get your vaccine, they're going to be, um, you will have the opportunity if you're interested in it to sign up for what's called the V-Safe Vaccination Health Tracker. Literally, it's an app um, that you can download to your phone and they will send you a reminder every, and I don't think it's every day, but regularly to say, how are you feeling? Are you having X, Y, Z symptoms? And they'll even give you a reminder, hey, it's time for you to get your, your second vaccine. So, you know, hundreds of thousands, and it may even be up to a million um, people have signed up for this as they get their vaccine. So we're watching this on a, um, a really regular basis. So how common are severe reactions um, with COVID vaccine? So anaphylaxis is a severe reaction where uh, a patient or a person can get short of breath, um, can have, um, can pass out, et cetera. So how common is anaphylaxis? Um, very early on, again, remember, we're watching this really closely. So this is from the CDC MMWR looking at allergic reactions, including anaphylaxis, after the first dose of the Pfizer vaccine. And so literally, as soon as these vaccines were given, within 10 days, you know, we're publishing data to say, how, how common is this? So in those first nine days or so, there were 21 cases of anaphylaxis. The key here no one died, okay? They had a severe reaction, no one died. Um, and out of oh, almost 2 million doses, so this was 11 cases per million, everyone survived. And all of this happened within the first 15 minutes. And then I'm gonna tell you a little bit later that you will be monitored after you receive your, your vaccine. Did the exact same thing after the Moderna. Moderna was authorized. We, you know, as in we, I say, the infectious diseases co community published really, you know, quickly, you know, how many adverse effects. So there were 10 cases out of 4 million, okay? And I always like to give people a comparison because everyone thinks, oh my goodness, what if I'm one of those, those 10? So if you look at likelihood of other things, so out of a million people, two will be struck by lightning, okay? 11 to 20 may experience an anaphylactic, anaphylactic reaction to these vaccines. 
112 out of a million may die in a, in a car accident. However, the key is out of a, out of a million people, 1,214 will die from, from COVID. So if we kind of weigh the risks versus, versus benefit, these are really rare reactions. And contrary to what you may have heard in the, in the media, et cetera, about people dying from the, the vaccines, we have no evidence at this time that there have been deaths because of the, the, the vaccines. So all this to say these vaccines are, are, are safe. So I receive a lot of questions with people asking, what if I have a latex allergy or food allergy or pet allergies or environmental allergies or a medicine allergy? A lot of people with penicillin allergies ask me that. I have a penicillin allergy myself. Is it safe to get the COVID, COVID vaccine? The answer is yes, okay? Yes. But who should absolutely not receive these vaccines? So I'm gonna show you the very, very rare person who should should not. So if you got your first dose, let's say of the Moderna or the Pfizer vaccine, and you had a really severe reaction, you are someone who either should not get the second dose or what honestly what, what we're doing, if we know of someone who has had a severe reaction after the first COVID vaccine, we're sending them to an allergy specialist to have that allergy specialist weigh in and you know, they may even be able to do graded dosing where they give you a tiny bit of the vaccine until you have um, um, response. And the other people are those who have had an immediate allergic reaction like anaphylaxis to something called polyethylene glycol. What is that? So polyethylene glycol is something that is within osmotic diure, um, I'm sorry, sorry, osmotic laxatives like Miralax. So unless you've had a severe allergic reaction to something like Miralax, you probably, not probably, you will, um, um, if you've had that severe reaction, you cannot get the, the, um, the, the vaccine. There's also something called polysorbate, which is um, in some medications. So let's say if you've had a severe reaction to a medication and you don't know if polysorbate is in it, call your pharmacist. Okay. Um, speak to your your physician. So all this to say is there. I don't there. I don't know anyone who, any of my patients or anyone who I've, I've taken care of who fall into this this category where they cannot receive the the vaccine. So essentially, almost everyone is um, is eligible. Um, in case you don't have health insurance or you know someone who doesn't have health insurance, if they want to know, can I still get the COVID-19 vaccine? The answer is yes. Cost is not an obstacle in getting vaccinated against COVID-19. COVID they are free at the health department, free at mass vaccination sites. And if you get it at your health care pro um, pr provider, you may be charged the cost to that to administer it, like there may be a nursing um, administration cost, but for the vaccine itself, they are free of charge. So what if you've already had COVID or you know, you know that you have antibodies? Should you wait or should you not get the, the, the vaccine? So if you have um, had COVID before or if you know you have antibodies, you are still eligible to receive them. Very early on, the CDC had stated, hey, if you recently had COVID, wait 90 days before you get the vaccine. That has changed. There is no you know, um, waiting period. The only people that I recommend is not getting it immediately is if you are actively sick with COVID. Like you have COVID right now and you're having fevers and you're having shortness of breath and you're having, having diarrhea, you should not. However, once you are asymptomatic, okay, feeling well, off of quarantine, go get your vaccine, okay? If that is, you know, seven days later, 10 days later, and you're eligible, go ahead and, and, and get it. So why get it? You know, you may be one of the people who are, young and healthy and you're wearing your masks, you know, why, why, why should you get it? First of all, number one, it's gonna help, you know, decrease the likelihood of you contracting COVID. And I always like to tell people there are two ways to get antibodies to, to COVID. You can either get it by vaccination or you can get it by contracting COVID. The safest way is via vax vaccination. And I think we can all agree 
we're all ready to get out of this pandemic. The way for us to get out of this pandemic is for each of us to do our part. And that's not just wearing your mask and socially distancing, but also if you're eligible and if you feel comfortable with it, getting, getting your vaccine as, as well. So this made me really happy this past Monday. The CDC re re released in the press release saying, um, given their first set of guidelines on how those of us who are fully vaccinated can visit safely with others. Because a lot of people were saying, you know, why get vaccinated? I'm gonna get vaccinated and I still have to wear a mask. I still have to socially distance. I still can't do anything. This has changed. So fully vaccinated people, and, and by fully vaccinated, we mean two weeks after your second dose of the mRNA vaccines or the um, your one dose of your Johnson & Johnson. You can visit with other fully vaccinated people inside, no masks, no socially distancing. You can visit with unvaccinated people in, from a single household who are at low risk for severe COVID um, disease. And if you're exposed to someone you don't have to quarantine um, um, anymore. So what this means is I am fully vaccinated. Both of my grandparents right now are fully vaccinated. My mother and stepfather are fully vaccinated. So when I go back to Alabama to visit, we can sit down and break bread and laugh and talk with each other. I can kiss them on their cheek. I can't tell you how much that, that, that means to me. So Getting vaccinated means that you're going to get close to, closer to feeling like you're, you know, back to your, your normal life. Um, yes, even when we get vaccinated, once you're outside of your, your home, still wear a mask, still socially distance, still, you know, do your best to avoid um, um, crowds. And what I also want to tell everyone is get your vaccine information from a reputable site. Okay, I enjoy Instagram like every everyone else. That's not where I get my medical in, in, information. So I don't think a lot of people realize you can go to the CDC and get wonderful um, information that is, you know, not, um, you know, med medical language. This is for, you know, um, um, family. So if you want some vaccine information for you or your family, go to the CDC website. This is being up updated really, really regularly you know, things to know, um, what to expect during your first visits, um, talks about severe in infection. So go to a reputable site to, to, to get your information. So you may be asking, when can I get mine? Okay, so, um, and let me tell you about Georgia and how we need to do, do better and we can all do our, our part in this. So this was updated a couple days ago. So um, we're looking at, um, the share of the population who's gotten at least one shot, okay? And those, that 21%, so that dark green are states that, you know, are, are really doing well. And over here, that light green, the lightest green are those who are, you know, kind of far behind every, everyone else. So where is Georgia? Okay, so let's go up to the top here on the left. So in the U U.S. total, 19%, this was a couple days ago, have received at least one shot. Georgia, so the highest, we have to give it to Connecticut, Alaska, South Dakota, okay, where 26% of their population has received at least one shot. Georgia, we are number 50 of the continental states, number 50, okay, so we have plenty of room to, to, to go here in, in Georgia. So um, I'm going to kind of tell you when you can get, get your vaccine, but um, go to the Georgia Department of Public Health. It's a wonderful um, resource. So just Google Georgia, Georgia Department of Health COVID-19 vaccines, and it's a wonderful full site. And what I love also is they um, have added um, a vaccine scheduling resource line that is Monday through Friday, 8 to 8 p.m., and Saturday to Sunday from eight to five, because what we all know is our elderly population, they don't know how to, you know, call and, and not call, but get online and have Wi-Fi and try to schedule this. So this is, um, you know, a, a phone number that they can call to help out with that. And it also helps you um, figure out where you can actually go to, to get your vaccines. So as of this week, okay, as of, of today, healthcare workers, law enforcement, fire personnel, first responders, 
residents of long-term facilities, those who are over 65. And what recently got added this week actually is that teachers, our educators and staff are eligible to get um, um, their vaccine. Adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities and their caregivers. So if you know someone who has taken care of someone who has Down syndrome, okay, they can um, can receive the, the if if the adult has Down syndrome, the, them and the caretaker can receive the vaccine. And parents of children, not children just yet, parents of children with complex medical conditions, as of today, can receive it. What I'm pleased about as well. So educators and staff, so from that bullet down, that just opened up on this past Monday. This upcoming Monday, it's being expanded further. So any adult over the age of 55, individuals with disabilities, and children who are 16 and older with certain medical conditions. However, Pfizer is the only vaccine that's approved for those who are 16 or 17. And what are those conditions of the children, okay? And if there's an adult caring for those children, here is a list. Asthma, cancer, cerebrovascular disease, kidney disease, sickle cell, et, et, et cetera. So again, the um, child has to be 16 and older with one of these medical con con conditions. And Pfizer is the only one that's approved for 16 and 17 year, year olds. Okay, so if you're attempting to um, schedule and you want to make sure that um, a, a child, the 16 year old, can receive it, you have to make sure that the Pfizer is being offered at that vaccine site. So here in Georgia, CVS, Walgreens, and some of the Georgia mass vaccination sites do have Pfizer vaccine. So yes, Georgia, we're way behind, but we opened up some you know, new categories this past Monday and opening up the you know, other categories um, um, in two days on this upcoming Monday. So when you go get to get your vaccine, what should you expect when you, when you get there? So whether you go to an occupational health clinic or if you, if you go to um, um, a mass vaccination site, et cetera, you will be socially distanced, okay? You will have to wear your, your mask. You will receive this little vaccination card that will say, what vaccine did you get? What lot, what day, okay? They're going to give you a fact sheet they're going to give you the ability to sign up for that V-Safe tracker. And it's really important everyone to know that you're gonna be monitored at least 15 minutes. And if you've had a severe reaction in the past, like anaphylaxis to another, you know, with um, any other medication, they're gonna make you sit down for, for 30 minutes, socially distanced. And then there are nurses and EMS um, personnel who may be walking around. So these severe reactions, if they're gonna occur, they usually occur within the first 30 minutes. So everyone wants to know about the variants. Um, how are these going to affect the response to the to, to current vaccines? So. Um, let me just kind of lay, lay down the line. As an infectious diseases physician, variants and mutations are not unexpected. We knew this was gonna, gonna happen. This is what viruses do for a living. They want to mutate so they can continue to be around to you know, in, infect us. So yes, there are variants, okay? Every location is not testing for them, but this is the key that I want everyone to know. So far, studies suggest that antibodies generated through vaccination with our currently authorized vaccines recognize these, these, these variants. So we're monitoring this, this really closely. Are there variants? Yes. Will, they be, will there be more variants? Likely, likely so. But should that delay us getting our vaccine? Absolutely, absolutely not. So I've told you how COVID has disproportionately affected Blacks and Hispanics and other minority communities. So let's look at who is receiving the vaccines the, the, thus far. So we all know it is important for everyone to get their vaccine, especially our, our Black communities and those who are really being disproportionately affected by this. So as of a couple days ago, of 62 million um, um, people with one or more doses, we have race and ethnicity information for half of, about half of them. So let's start up top. If you're Hispanic or Latino, you make up 18% of the general US population 
However, only eight and a half percent of those who've received vaccines thus far. If you're black, if you're like me, you're black, we make up 13% of the US population. However, only 7.2% of those who are, um, are receiving vaccines. Why? It is not just because of vaccine hesitancy, okay? I'm kind of getting a little frustrated by continuing to hear, oh, it's just because black people don't want vaccines. That's, that, that's not the entire um, reason why. It's also because we have to ensure that underserved communities have access to the, 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 the vaccines outreach and education, which is why I'm, I'm passionate about, about educating. So back to Mrs. Jones. So of course I would never show you all the actual picture of a, a, a patient. So this is my grandmother. She is my why, why it, getting vaccinated is so important. On the left is my mother. So my why of getting vaccinated is because I want to protect my grandmother. I want to protect my, my mother. And I'm sure that that is your why as well. You wanna protect your, your, your loved ones. And also we have to think about just loss in America. Over 500,000 of our fellow Americans, black, white, Hispanic, children, teachers, preachers, you know, we have to stop this, 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 this loss. So thank you very much for your, for your attention. I really look forward to using the, these next 20, 20 or so minutes to answer any questions and you know, any hesitation that you all may have. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so we already have a handful of questions in the, um, in the chat. So I will just start with those. Um, the first one that just came in was, are these vaccines approved by the FDA? So can you talk a little bit more about that? Absolutely. So each of these vaccines have gone through what we call emergency use author authorization, okay? So in almost most medications and most vaccines, um, many will go through this, this, this process where you have emergency use authorization. And what that means is we are in a global emergency and waiting the time that it would, would need to have the quote unquote full FDA approval, we cannot risk that because of the number of, of deaths, okay? So did the FDA you know, have input with respects to the emergency use authorization? Of course they did, a a absolutely. So are they fully FDA approved? No, they're, 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 they're not. Have they gone through um, emergency use authorization? And this is with, you know, vaccine experts, physicians, um, et cetera, yes. Thank you. Um, and then a couple of questions about children. So has the vaccine been tested on children? Um, when will they be able to get it? Wonderful, wonderful question. So the way that, that vaccine trials always happen is we start with healthy grown people because we all want to protect our, 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 our little babies. So um, um, we don't know just yet when these vaccines will be available for children, but just know that we are enrolling children are going through um, um, are being enrolled in vaccine studies as we, we speak. So I anticipate this summer, but I, I, we do not have an answer just, just yet. But yes, these trials are ongoing as we speak in, in kids. Okay, and then when um, you talked a little bit about the older kids who have med medical conditions, um, what about the younger kids when it gets approved, if they have those medical conditions? Oh, absolutely. Ab absolutely. And likely when they're approved for, for children, just like in adults, you know, you do, it, it was a healthcare workers and now we're getting to those with, you know, who have comorbidities and illnesses. I can, I anticipate even when it opens up to children, it's likely going to open up to children with underlying health conditions first and then open up to other, uh, other healthy children. Thank you. Um, if, if you've already contracted the virus, is there still a need to get the vaccine? There is absolutely a need to, to get to get the vaccine. So um, my so Emory offered free COVID antibody um, testing in in April, and I was knocked off my feet that I had antibodies at that time. 
had not gotten sick, didn't feel a thing, was totally, totally surprised. But the reason that we still recommend that you get the vaccine, even after you've either had antibodies or you have, um, have had infection, is we don't know exactly how much virus you were exposed to, how many antibodies you, you, you've had. And if you were like me and had antibodies almost a year ago, they may be gone by, they may be gone by now. So um, at least with the, with the vaccines, you're getting a set amount that will typically in, induce a certain amount of immunity that we know, so far we know, we anticipate that um, you, this immunity will last three to six months, okay? But of course, the longer out we go, we'll have, have more information on that. So long story short, yes, yeah, still get your vaccine. Okay. So if you've had it, if you don't get the vaccine and you've had it, you can still get it again. Oh, absolutely. Yes. So with, with respects to contracting COVID again, yes, you can contract COVID again. Okay. Um, and there was a question early on of just if you could re-explain what anaphylaxis is. Yes. So anaphylaxis is um, a severe reaction. Like most people know of someone who may have a severe bee allergy and they walk around with their little EpiPen just in case they're, they're bitten by a bee. So anaphylaxis will cause a serious drop in your blood pressure. It can cause shortness of breath. It can cause um, palpitations and an increased um, heart rate. So the, those folks, let's say with the bee allergies who carry the EpiPen, that the EpiPen that you kind of, you know, put, put in your body, that helps reverse that lowered um, um, blood pressure. So this is someone, so it can be a life-threatening um, reaction, but it, again, it's extraordinarily rare. Um, can you talk a little bit about the strike proteins again? Yes. So the, the spike proteins, so just imagine you have, you have your, your, your virus and your, the viruses like they need to attach to your body and to your cells in some way. And that spike protein, all those little proteins that are kind of sticking out, that's how it attaches to the cell to, to, to get in. So, um, and we know that all of the coronaviruses irrespective, even those who, um, even with the, the variants, they all make that sp spike protein. So what you want is these vaccines stimulate your body to only make that spike protein. Your body even recognizes that spike protein as foreign and starts making those, those, those antibodies. So even though your body has not seen the actual virus, it is fooled into thinking it, that it's the actual virus because it sees the, the, um, the, the spike protein. So um, that's the target for essentially all of these, the, these vaccines. And you, what we want is our body to make antibodies to that protein. Okay, so why do you need two shots for the Pfizer and Moderna and just one for the Johnson & Johnson? Excellent question. So it's because there are two completely different types of, 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 of vaccines. So with the, um, the messenger RNA um, vaccine, so again, what you want is um, as high of efficacy as, as possible. So a lot of people have kind of heard through the grapevine too, like, oh, just get one and that's, that, that, that's good enough. So the after what I like to tell people is after the first dose of Moderna or Pfizer, you may get yourself up to about 50% effectiveness. You want more than that. After you get your second vi back vaccine, about a week to a week and a half to two weeks after that, that's when you get up to the, the, the 95%. So it's different because there are two different platforms of, of vaccines. And then with the viral vector, like the Johnson & Johnson, it's, 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 it's the one shot. So what I tell people, you know, they may ask, well, which one should I get? You know, should I just kind of, you know, wait around and only get the Moderna or the, the, the Pfizer? What I recommend is getting the first thing smoking, the first thing that is, is, is available. If the Johnson & Johnson had been available in December, that would have been the, the one that I would have um, received. Some people who are super afraid of needles and already don't want to get the, the, the vaccine, you may get the Johnson & Johnson. You know, let's say if, if, if you have, if we have a population that it may be more difficult to find them again or get them again, maybe our homeless population, you know, if we can get you and get one and, you know, if, if it's difficult for, to, to find that homeless person again, at least we've given, given them the, the, the one. So the answer is whatever is available, 
that. So that's the one that I would recommend. Um, so as a follow-up, is there, just to reiterate, is there any chance that you could get COVID after you've had the vaccine? And if so, how would that change your experience? Absolutely. So um, again, nothing in medicine, honestly, not much, not much in life is 100%. So the um, knowing that the Moderna and Pfizer are like 95% effective. So remember that just leaves a, a really slight chance that you may contract COVID. But again, remember, no one died who have who's received the vaccine and no one's been hospitalized, okay? Um, and what I love about the Johnson & Johnson also is when we talk about asymptomatic um, carrier. So let's say I get the vaccine and I get laxed and I'm out, you know, partying and, 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 and et cetera, can I, I can contract COVID, unlikely, less likely, but I can contract it and pass it on to someone with a suppressed immune system who's, you know, older, at, at, um, et cetera. So to, to answer your question, yes, you can contract it. It is unlikely and less likely that you contract it. If you were to contract it, you can still feel really reassured that you will not die or go to the hospital. And with the Johnson & Johnson, we have evidence that you will be a lot less likely to even transmit it to someone else, even if you're asymptomatic. So there, there are just so many advantages to, 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 to getting this. And what I like to tell people is, if you don't want to get it for yourself, think about your great aunt with diabetes who you want to visit. Think about, you know, the, the little kid, you know, who may have, have diabetes that you can contract it and, and, and spread it to them. So if you don't do it for yourself, you know, at, at least try to do it for your, um, for your loved ones in your community. Um, so there's some questions about safety. So how do we know that they're the long-term effects five, 10 years down the line, that they'll be safe? Um, and, and the information about um, vaccines alternating our DNA or having some kind of long-term effect on their Absolutely. concerns. So I'll, I'll start with the, the second question with respects to um, the vaccines affecting or altering your DNA. It is not, it's not possible because the messenger RNA is, um, cannot incorporate into your, your, your DNA. And people ask, well, what happens to that messenger RNA? It degrades. Well, what happens to those spike proteins? Like all proteins in your body, they, they degrade and completely go away. So there's no integration into your, um, into your, um, your DNA. With respects to you know, how do you know if, um, if 10 years from um, down the line, we're gonna, you're gonna have a, a problem. So what we do have plenty of evidence for is we have over 50 years of research with other, other vaccines. So the long-term effect issue with vaccines, it just doesn't, it, it, it doesn't happen. It's extraordinarily rare, like one in, in millions. Can I promise you that there will not be, you know, um, 10 years down the line that we may not find something that um, these, these vaccines may contribute to? I, I'm not gonna lie to you. I don't know what's gonna happen, you know, 10, 10 years down the line. But what I know is of the patients and the participants in these vaccine trials, you know, we're getting getting to the point where we're, you know, six, nine months down the line and we have nothing to say that there are long-term side effects. And I will, I know what you all have heard, so I'll just say it. We have nothing to say that you are going to get Guillain-Barre or multiple sclerosis or that these vaccines will affect your, your, your fertility. I don't have children and would love to have children one day. There's no way I would have taken that vaccine if I, I, I thought it would do that. If you are pregnant, even the American College of Obstetrics and, and Gynecologists, what they say is, it from these are the gynecologists talking. It is okay for you to receive the um, the, the the vaccine. Um, if you're breastfeeding, it is okay for you to receive the vaccine. If you don't feel comfortable, and I want to make this key as, as well, speak to your physician. I feel like a lot of people are kind of making this decision not to get vac vaccinated without speaking to your trusted professional who's taking care of you, you know, all, all this time. So try not to make the decision based on what you may have heard and what some, someone said. Make an appointment to see your primary care doctor. Make an appointment to see your allergist. 
you know, even if it's tell a, you know, a televisit, because I, I really think that these one-on-one -on -one conversations are, um, are super important. Mm -hmm. um, and then some questions about timing. Um, so one is, will it be something that you have to get annually like the flu? Um, and then the next question is about the first and second shots. Um, so the flu first, and then I'll do the other one. <laughs> Yeah, yes. So do we know whether or not we're going to require boosters? I look forward to knowing that as well. It's too early to, to, to know. We don't know that. But I, what I do want you all to know is that's one of the good things about messenger RNA um, um, vaccines as well is it's very easy to, you know, kind of switch things up if, if you need to to put out a, a booster if that um, if is necessary. So we don't know the answer to that, but also know that there are trials that are going on right now, testing to make sure that, you know, if we have to have a booster to the UK variant or the South African variant, that we are ready and thinking, thinking, thinking ahead. Great. So we don't know just yet. Great. Um, and uh, so, someone had a first vaccine um, scheduled, but they didn't get the second shot within the 21 days. How long can you actually go between the two? Excellent question. So um, what, the, what the CDC says is, if you receive your first dose and for whatever reason, you, you know, can't get your second dose, that you can even get it up to six weeks later. Okay. And, you know, so do your best to try to get it right on right on time, but there is some 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 flexibility up to six to six weeks later. And um, also, let's say if you're one of those persons that you're just like, I don't know if I want to go back to get a second one, then get, get your Johnson and Johnson, you know, one 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 and done. Um, another point that um, um, I really want to bring up is the importance of separating your vaccine by two weeks from other types of vaccines. So let's say you wanna get your flu vaccine as well. You have to separate these by um, 14 days for any other vaccine, whether that's a shingles vaccine, flu vaccine, you know, other other boosters can't, can should not be within two weeks. Two weeks, okay. Mm -hmm. um, how would you recommend talking to kids and asking if they'd consider volunteering for the vaccine trial? One excellent question. So one of my um, colleagues who does public health, and she is a physician, but not a practicing physician, um, um, reached out to me and said, hey, I think I, and she's a Black woman, I think I'm interested in enrolling my 14-year-old in, in a trial for, for vaccines. How do you feel about this? If you had children, would you, would, would you do it? And she, you know, felt kind of encouraged to do this because she's a Black woman. We've seen how this has ravaged our community. And the only way to know how these vaccines are going to work in Black people is by some Black people and some Black people with their children being agreeable to, to, to get the, va the, um, the, the, the vaccine. So what I would say is if I had a child, I would feel comfortable with my child receiving it, primarily because I know that there would be a 50-50 chance that they would actually get the real get the real deal. Yeah. So, you know, there's a 50-50 chance that, you know, they, they would be the first ones to, um, to, um, to get the vaccine. And um, also, and I know I come from this from a, a different place because I, I am in the medical Feel, but I just see, I have, I can't tell you how it's broken my heart to see everyone who has contracted COVID seems to look like me or like my grandmother, or like my, my loved ones. So I take this very personal and it is important, you know, moving forward, I plan to enroll myself in, in, in future trials. I couldn't enroll in the vaccine trials because I somehow ended up with antibodies very, very early on. So I think you should, you know, talk to your children to say, you know, this, tell me how you feel about, especially if they're old enough to kind of think, think things through, is this something that you would be, would be interested in? Um, you know, of course, when they go to enroll, et, et cetera, there will be a lot of edu education as, as well. Yeah. You know, if they're able to make their own decisions and don't feel comfortable with, with doing that, I definitely would, would not. Okay. Um, and then what can we do as citizens to improve the racial disparities in regards to getting this vaccine? How can we support our communities? Thank you so much for, for, for asking. So what I would say for at the moment, let's say if you were 30 years old and you're healthy as can be and you know you're going to be at the, at, at the end of this, this line, do you know of, a, of an older person in your community or in your church 
who may not have someone who can help them get their, their, their vaccine. You can be that advocate for them. Do you know someone who you know, has a child with you know, a 17 year old with, with Down syndrome and they may need help with transportation getting to a vaccine site? You can help them um, um, with it. And, but I think most importantly, I can be a vaccine advocate all I want, but people are gonna say, oh, but you're a doctor. Of course, you're gonna say that. However, if you're their friend or if you're their colleague and you can say, I got the vaccine, I did, I did fine. I can, you know, drive you there. I, we need more vaccine ad advocates. So seeking and being intentional about who you may know, who, who, who likely needs your help. Okay. It seems like a great place to stop, but we'll let a couple, just if you have any last minute questions, I think I got everything through the Q and A. Um, Thank you so much for such good information. Um, and again, can you remind us where, if we still want to get some more information, where we can get it when we don't have you to ask live? <laughs> yes. So just, just Google Georgia Department of Public Health COVID vaccines. And, you, and it's updated literally almost every day. I look at it every day. And it's user-friendly. And it will tell you which CVS has vaccines, which Ingalls has vaccines, which doesn't, which, you know, um, who's up for vaccines right now. So Georgia Department of Public Health COVID-19 vaccine. Just okay. Google it. Thank you so much.